Hello, everybody. I'm Chris Harding, the Director for Interoperability at the Open Group, and uh, part of my role is to be the Forum Director for Open Platform 3.0, which is the Open Group initiative to uh, enable enterprises to gain business value from new technologies, including the Internet of Things and also including such things as cloud computing, um, social computing, mobile computing, and big data analysis. But today our focus is on the Internet of Things, and it's my pleasure to introduce Carrie Framling, who will give the main presentation. He is a Professor of Practice in Building Information Modeling at Aalto University in Finland, and he is also CEO of uh, the Finnish company Control Things. And last but not least, uh, he is the Chair of the Open Platform 3.0 Workgroup on the Internet of Things. So, Kerry, over to you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, since the introductions are made already, I'll go straight to the presentation. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> today's uh, the summary of today's uh, presentation uh, is the following. Uh, uh, I'll go through some of the background uh, uh, of uh, our work, uh, wh where it comes from, why we did it, uh, and so on. Then uh, go through the principles and use of, uh, of the open messaging interface, OMI, and open data format standards. Uh, show uh, uh, a reference implementation uh, of these uh, standards, uh, what you can do with it, how it works, and so on. Uh, some uh, applications uh, for illustrating uh, what you can do in reality, a quick comparison with other standards, and then a conclusion. So, <clears throat> The background, uh, well, uh, our work uh, in uh, actually at Helsinki University of Technology on, on the Internet of Things uh, started around 2000, uh, and, uh, and in uh, 2001 we wrote this uh, dialogue, Internet of Things uh, middleware, which uh, at the time it was very focused on RFID tags and so on, uh, but uh, we actually quickly came into into the, um, the kind of Internet of Things that we are dealing with today, meaning uh, sensors, intelligent products, uh, uh, getting information from all kinds of different uh, information sources about different products, uh, what happens to them, and so on and so on. Uh, so the figure that you can see here uh, actually illustrates uh, that kind of, uh, of a system. Uh, uh, then we started or joined this uh, EU product called Promise uh, in 2004, uh, where we could apply all, all these uh, different uh, concepts. Uh, now in Promise, uh, the goal was uh, to uh, to manage the uh, life cycle of uh, different kinds of products uh, in different kinds of uh, domains. So uh, we had uh, companies uh, illustrated here, such as uh, Caterpillar with their uh, their heavy machines. Uh, we had Iveco with uh, their trucks, uh, Fiat with their cars, uh, Intercity with the fridges and other household devices, Intracom with the telecommunications equipment and so on. And uh, with all this, uh, these different companies uh, in Promise uh, wanted to be able to do was to uh, collect information about the usage of their products so that they could uh, detect any kind of uh, problems and uh, do uh, improve the maintenance of them as well as the design and manufacturing of, of those products uh, based on all this collected data. So in order to, to be able to do this for all these uh, different uh, companies uh, and uh, domains, uh, uh, in Promise, uh, we came up with some uh, interoperability specifications uh, that we then uh, uh, took and, uh, and went with uh, to uh, the, the open group where uh, uh, this uh, work group uh, on the Internet of Things, or actually it was called uh, Quantum Lifecycle Management, was established in 2010. And uh, finally, <clears throat> in uh, 2014, so last uh, autumn, we uh, meaning the Open Group and the Internet of Things Working Group uh, work group uh, published uh, this uh, open messaging interface and open data format. Uh, now, uh, before I go to the next slide, uh, I would emphasize uh, the figure that you see here. Uh, so uh, you have many different kinds of uh, product uh, sensors, RFID technologies, but you also have uh, uh, back-end services and, and so on. Uh, 
So this is the kind of view that uh, we have had uh, of the Internet of Things when uh, specifying these, uh, these standards. Uh, now, uh, that's uh, as a certain contrast uh, compared to how uh, I, it seems like most uh, people and companies uh, uh, look at the Internet of Things uh, today. Uh, so I, I see uh, uh, loads of different uh, systems and platforms uh, where the main goal uh, seems to, uh, to connect uh, or gather sensory information into uh, different applications, platforms, and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, it seems to be the case quite often even that uh, that you might have several sets of uh, sensors uh, measuring the same thing at the same place, uh, but just feeding different platforms and, and applications. So uh, that's uh, what what uh, is meant by this uh, that the, the, this point saying that data is collected into vertical uh, silos. Uh, so uh, uh, you would have loads of in interesting and useful uh, data and information potentially available, but uh, it's difficult to use it uh, because uh, they are connect uh, collected to uh, these uh, specific applications or platforms. Uh. Also, if you want to do some kind of machine-to-machine -machine communication, uh, that tends to be limited to, to the local networks, and uh, it's uh, difficult or even impossible to do a bidirectional control. Uh, so uh, the challenge is uh, with uh, this, uh, with the way the Internet of Things uh, works today, is that uh, you actually get uh, or gather huge amounts of data from sensors. Uh, and uh, uh, this data keeps on being collected uh, just because it's uh, supposed to be good to have loads of data. And then uh, you get this phenomenon called uh, big data, and you sort of hope uh, for somebody to be able to analyze this data and come up with uh, with something useful. Uh, well, that might be the case, but, uh, but uh, in practice uh, we have seen that most of that data might not be usable uh, or interesting even in, in practice. Also, it's uh, hard to achieve interoperability with these, uh, between these uh, different devices, machines, uh, platforms, applications, and so on. And finally, uh, the Internet of Things that really requires communication between systems and organizations, not just local machine-to-machine -machine communication. So, uh, <clears throat> what uh, we want to enable or think we are enabling with the open messaging interface and, uh, and the open data format, uh, it's uh, really what you can see in the red arrows uh, here in, in this picture. So uh, we're not uh, speaking so much about sensors. So we are sensors, uh, we are more dealing with the, with the more intelligent products uh, that might uh, have or usually have uh, sensors uh, connected to them. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> And then we have uh, these uh, platforms uh, just as before. Uh, now, what we want to enable, I think we are enabling with OMI and ODF, is that you can have direct machine-to-machine uh, -machine, uh, communication as bidirectional, uh, even uh, over the internet, not just uh, locally. But you can also connect uh, these uh, different uh, products or information systems, uh, not just to the, the initial application that they were feeding to, but also easily uh, share information with other platforms and applications, so directly from the machines to the systems, or from the systems to other systems, and so on. So, <clears throat> uh, with OMI and ODF, uh, we think that horizontal integration should be as easy as a vertical integration, and even vertical integration should become much uh, easier than it is uh, just now, uh, when you have appropriate uh, standards for doing it. Uh, so uh, also with the OMI and the ODF, uh, the purpose is that you should be able to collect the data as and when needed on the fly uh, without having to do any programming or, or systems integration. And uh, you should also be able to establish uh, this kind of two-way time-limited information flows between trusted entities and the physical products when you, you need it for, for some reason. Now we'll see uh, examples of uh, how you can, how you do that in, in practice in, in a moment. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, based on, on this uh, view of, of uh, the Internet of Things, uh, so for the, for our, for the Internet of Things uh, work group, uh, it's really a question of uh, uh, creating and enabling systems of systems. Uh, so, uh, 
uh, for us, uh, okay, a uh, system uh, could be or has been in the past, uh, well, just an RFID tag, or it could be uh, an intelligent sensor. It could uh, be some system connected behind a gateway, uh, or it could uh, even be a, an entire ERP system or the weather forecast service or a smart car. Uh, but uh, the specifications of OMI and ODF have uh, been specified in such a way that they are agnostic uh, uh, in what comes to the size of the system. You, you sort of deal with all kinds of systems uh, uh, in a pair-to-pair -pair manner. Now, uh, <clears throat> uh, I already mentioned, uh, I think, this uh, product lifecycle management and uh, what we have been calling a closed-loop lifecycle management uh, for some the last 10 years, uh, maybe. So. Uh, and that's a typical case where you have a system, so a need for systems of, of systems. Uh, so uh, if you take um, any kind of, uh, of uh, well, most, uh, well, some, some, uh, any kind of smarter products, uh, let's say, uh, like this way, such as a, as a truck, uh, uh, and uh, if you need to do uh, to perform some maintenance uh, on that specific uh, truck, for instance. Uh, well, uh, all the information about that truck uh, uh, might be stored in uh, many, many different information systems uh, owned by many different uh, different organizations and so on. Uh, so uh, if I want to do the maintenance on my Iveco truck, for instance, well, uh, first I, I will uh, want to get access to, uh, to how the truck has been used uh, and uh, so different statistics are stored on the truck itself in, in the truck's information system. But I would also like to get access to, uh, to, to earlier maintenance records uh, made e either by me or by some other organization, as well as, uh, as access uh, to, to the maintenance instructions uh, for that specific uh, truck uh, that might come from the manufacturer or somewhere else. So uh, <clears throat> this, uh, when you are dealing with uh, closed loop lifecycle management uh, that means that uh, that you really are dealing with systems of systems uh, where the systems can be uh, embedded systems uh, sensors uh, or any kind of, of back end systems of uh, different uh, different kinds so in this picture uh, the iot it's really an enabler for accessing all this information and omi and odf is, uh, are the standards that enable you to to do it uh, then to some other kinds of uh, systems of systems, uh, as uh, Chris said, uh, the Internet of Thing, uh, uh, the Internet of Thing workgroup uh, is a part of the Open Platform 3.0 forum, and uh, together with the, the Open Platform 3 uh, uh, forum, uh, we have uh, specified a certain number of use cases that are illustrated by by this uh, picture here. Uh, so. Uh, uh, here you can see uh, also uh, that uh, it's really about systems or systems. So uh, if you want to do uh, intelligent utility energy management, uh, uh, intelligent automotive management, intelligent traffic management, and so on, uh, you typically need uh, information coming from uh, many different kinds of sources. So in the same way, uh, uh, OMI and ODF are really enablers uh, for these uh, red lines uh, that you can see here between different for enabling. Uh, ad hoc information flows uh, between relevant uh, information systems uh, for whatever is, uh, is your, your application. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> then uh, the next uh, part of the presentation is uh, to have a look at what, uh, what OMI and ODF uh, actually look like and, uh, and how you use them. So as I said, they were officially published by the Open Group on the 16th of October in 2014. And uh, the uh, okay, the two different, the two uh, standards uh, have different roles in the sense that the Open Messaging Interface uh, specifies a protocol for communication, while the Open Data Format uh, uh, specifies a standard, uh, a very generic standard for the payload. Now the model for this uh, is uh, similar to what uh, is being used on the web. Uh, so uh, as uh, presumably most of you know, uh, 
uh, <clears throat> for the web, the cornerstone uh, protocols uh, and standards are HTTP and HTML, where HTTP uh, defines uh, uh, or specifies a very simple command vocabulary for accessing information, while HTML is, uh, is the format for, uh, for specifying the, the actual contents or the payload. Uh, now, uh, what you can do uh, with, uh, with OMI and ODF is that uh, when you have some new uh, uh, information system or, uh, or a new device uh, that uh, comes into, uh, into a new context, so uh, for instance, I install a new, uh, new machine or a new sensor into, uh, into my home, then uh, that machine should be able to publish uh, uh, that it's uh, present there, as well as uh, tell what is the information that it can provide, as well as what are the services provided by it. Now, uh, then the building and the other systems uh, there, they should be able to discover that, okay, now we have, we have a new information system here, a new device, uh, and it provides uh, these and these uh, pieces of information, and these services, so now we can do new things uh, if, together with, the, with this new system. Uh, doing new things, uh, that assumes, of course, that you can uh, communicate with it, so uh, that means that you need to have read and write operations for accessing uh, and updating information. And uh, uh, the, uh, one of the cornerstone operations is, of course, that you should also be able to subscribe uh, to information. So one information should uh, easily be able to subscribe to information from, uh, from uh, this new information system. And uh, contrary to many other protocols and standards, uh, we are not using the the complete uh, publish subscribe design pattern we are actually using the observer design pattern i won't go into the into the sort of uh, uh, very details in uh, in in how that differs uh, just now uh, both uh, standards omi and odf are specified using xml schema and uh, one thing that uh, makes them uh, quite different from uh, uh, most or uh, maybe even all uh, Internet of Things uh, standards that I'm aware of is that uh, they can be trans transported by any underlying protocol, more or less. Uh, so uh, usually we are using HTTP or HTTPS, but uh, you can actually run over my and ODF also over FTP, SMTP, XMTP, uh, file transfer, transfer, even send, uh, send them on USB sticks, plain sockets, and so on. Now this uh, is uh, quite important in the sense that uh, you can use OMI and ODF uh, both as standardized IoT REST APIs uh, uh, as well as, uh, as using them for machine-to-machine -machine communication as well as machine-to-system communication, system-to-machine and so on and so on. So uh, <clears throat> then some more details about the open messaging interface. Uh, here you can see all the possible operations so, uh, uh, and the variations of them. So write, uh, read, or and cancel. Now, uh, uh, of course, uh, well, the names tell it more or less uh, directly what you can do with them. Uh, with a reader, you can get the current uh, and historical information about the alerts, uh, sensor values, and so on. This is the immediate retrieval part here. You can also write information uh, using the write operation. And then the subscription uh, operation uh, comes uh, here in this branch. Uh, so you can do it in many different ways, using a callback address, without callback address. And uh, uh, you will see uh, in a moment that uh, you can uh, specify for how long a subscription should be, should be valid. So it's, uh, it can be time limited. Uh, you can specify regular intervals for it or use uh, event-based uh, subscriptions. And uh, you also have a piggybacking functionality that allows you to, uh, to do even control uh, through uh, firewalls and so on. And then finally, the cancel operation uh, for canceling subscriptions before they expire. Then uh, <clears throat> the open data format. Uh, uh, just uh, specify or allows you to specify a very generic uh, object uh, hierarchy. So it's uh, uh, shown here on the on the right side. So uh, an ODF uh, structure always starts with this object uh, uh, 
object on the on the uppermost level. Uh, object can contain uh, other objects, and uh, then uh, every object uh, can have properties uh, specified by info items or other sub-objects. And every info item can have uh, some metadata uh, about it, as well as values, of course. And uh, here on the left, uh, you can you can see just a simple example of uh, how you combine OMI and ODF. Uh, so this uh, would be a write command, and uh, what uh, or the object that is sending the, the write command is the, this uh, smart fridge uh, that you can see here, identified by okay uh, sort of generic name here in this case and uh, it is sending uh, the current fridge temperature set point and the current freezer temperature set point so this is a very simple example of uh, what an OMI and ODF uh, message uh, can look like you'll see more exam examples of these in just a moment now uh, and what is more in interesting is to see uh, how you can subscribe uh, to information. So uh, in, that, in this case, uh, I am using the read operation. Uh, I am giving an interval of uh, 600 seconds. So I am requesting for information every 10 minutes. And it should be sent uh, to the OMI node at this uh, callback address. And the time to live uh, minus one means that this uh, subscription should uh, exist forever or until it's uh, cancelled. And uh, in this case, I'm using ODF as uh, the query language. Uh, so I am saying to this, uh, or telling this OMI node that I want to read information from uh, this smart fridge 22334411. And the information that I want to get every 10 minutes uh, is the door status, the temperature, and the consumed electrical power measure. And then once uh, this subscription has been made, I start getting this kind of response uh, messages every ten every ten minutes uh, with uh, the actual or with the same ODF uh, structure, but uh, with the actual values uh, here, as you can see in the by the value tags. So uh, <clears throat> this uh, these are this is sort of the basic uh, introduction to uh, to what it looks like. Uh, now it will be become a little bit more challenging because we are passing uh, live. Uh, <coughs> so uh, as for most uh, standards, uh, it's, uh, it's very useful to have a, have a reference implementation that uh, shows uh, how uh, you can use uh, the standards, how you should use them, uh, that you can interact with uh, so that you can check that your implementation is uh, compatible. And also, since it's uh, published as open source, uh, you can actually take the code as such and integrate it into your own applications, so that uh, so that the uh, implementation efforts of uh, of getting the standards uh, into your own system are are uh, kept as uh, low as possible. Now, the plan is also to disseminate uh, this re reference implementation through uh, this IoT Eclipse.org. Uh, and other appropriate uh, uh, dissemination channels. And uh, what uh, this uh, reference implementation implements, so, okay, we have URL-based discovery and read operations and the web GUI for more advanced operations. It's uh, written in Scala, in the Scala programming language, uh, which is uh, sort of the new language uh, that's arising at least uh, in our university. But we do also have implementations in uh, quite a few other languages. I'll uh, quickly show you a small implementation made just uh, with a simple Unix uh, shell script for publishing information. So <clears throat> then I will I will jump over to uh, to the to Google Chrome uh, and uh, or any any browser, but uh, in this case I am using Chrome. So uh, uh, what I will start with is uh, showing how you can access information using just simple URLs. So if I write here uh, the address of the OMI node slash objects, I will get a list of all the objects uh, that I have available here at uh, this OMI node. Uh, then since I'm sitting in Finland, I will of course go to the sauna and uh, uh, and uh, see uh, what information I have from there. Uh, and uh, 
I think you got uh, the idea already. I just uh, see uh, what are the different uh, sub-objects and info items, and then I add them to the URL and uh, get access to uh, to the next level. Uh, then, uh, if I want to get just a raw value, I can write slash value here at the end. And if I want to get access to the metadata about uh, this uh, temperature info item, then I just write metadata here. Uh, so, uh, well, metadata can can be uh, information such as uh, unit uh, manufacturer and so on. Um, to be honest, uh, the, this is just uh, an example of how you can specify metadata. In uh, practice, uh, it's recommended to use uh, some some other kind of standard for uh, for, for device descriptions or uh, this uh, UDEF framework, for instance, a uh, UDEF standard uh, that's, uh, that uh, is also uh, developed by the Open Group. Uh. So that was uh, the URL-based uh, discovery and uh, accessing uh, or how you can access information that way. Now, uh, if you want to uh, use the total range of uh, possibilities uh, and functionality of OMI and ODF, then uh, you should go to this uh, example uh, uh, web uh, user interface. Uh, now, uh, <clears throat> what I have here is uh, first the address of the OMI node again. Uh, it has now fetched all the objects automatically that are available there. So uh, here I can select from, from the hierarchy or uh, from this window what information I would like to request. So uh, for the sauna, for instance, I take the CO2 level, uh, current humidity and temperature. And uh, then in the next step, I generate the corresponding OMI and ODF uh, request. Uh, now I can modify the parameters of the request uh, from here. So the time to live uh, uh, says uh, how long uh, this uh, message should be uh, kept alive if it can't be delivered. Or if it's a subscription, then it says uh, how long uh, the subscription should uh, should be uh, uh, should be valid. Now the interval parameter uh, specifies in seconds uh, how often I want to get the values. Uh, or if I specify minus one here, then that means uh, that I want to uh, to get uh, an event every time that the value changes. So, for instance, that's good for uh, monitoring door openings and closings, or, or uh, let's say a fridge uh, that's going to break down. Then you would like to have potentially a sub subscription that's, uh, that is eternal, but uh, you only want to get an event uh, when something something unexpected is is happening. Uh, then you do also have the possibility to uh, specify a time frame. This is if you're just doing a basic read for getting historical data. Between two dates, uh, you can also request for the newest uh, N, not, well, the newest number, newest available number of historical data available, or the oldest ones. And then you can specify a callback uh, where, where the data should be sent. Uh, but in this case, uh, what I'll do uh, is uh, that I'll just uh, Send uh, the request, and uh, then I sort of I get a I get a response uh, that uh, shows me just uh, the the current values uh, of these uh, of these info items. Uh, now uh, in this case uh, the, these are fake uh, values because uh, since it's a reference implementation uh, that uh, is supposed to run anywhere, uh, we haven't connected this one specific one to to real sensors. But you'll see some some of those in in just a moment. Okay, uh, I think that was uh, showing what uh, the read operation looks like. Uh, now, uh, next I will uh, jump to something a little bit uh, more nerdy or geeky. So, uh, what uh, I have here, it is, uh, I just jumped over to my uh, virtual box, uh, virtual machine with, with a Linux uh, running there. Now, uh, 
<clears throat> I'll try to be uh, not to be too quick uh, with this, uh, but uh, what we have here it's uh, uh, actually a Unix uh, shell script that uh, is uh, a generic uh, script for generating write messages uh, using OMI and ODF. So uh, I'll just show you that it's very short. This will also be published uh, as open source. So this sort of implements the whole OMI ODF that you need for producing this kind of write message. So the formatting doesn't look uh, that great uh, here, uh, but that wasn't the purpose. Normally it would be on just one line, but uh, what you can see here, it's uh, that uh, you have the OMI header. So this is a write operation. And uh, what I am sending, it's an object called a basement one, because I plan to install uh, some uh, temperature and humidity sensors into a room in our basement. Uh, and I have three different sensors and for, okay, so sensor three and all three sensors provide me with temperature and humidity values. Uh, now the actual physical sensors are uh, one wire sensors uh, and uh, they're on the table here beside me in fact, uh, so I could show them live. but. Uh, and the way that you get uh, the information from them is uh, by defining a simple uh, data structure that looks uh, like this. So uh, uh, this system is actually running on a Wi-Fi router, uh, which we have flashed uh, with, uh, with a Linux and installed uh, these scripts uh, on it. And uh, uh, the fact or how the way in which we define this whole uh, ODF structure that you saw looks like this. So I just defined the basement one level here, the three sensors here, and I say that they all have temperature and humidity, humidity readings. And if I uncomment these, which I do when it's uh, when the script is installed on the on the router, then I will actually get the real values from uh, from the sensors. So the point uh, <clears throat> that I want to make uh, by showing, uh, showing this system is that uh, you can implement uh, an OMI node that uh, gets real sensor values. So in this case, uh, six uh, sensor values with real minimal effort and on, on really, uh, let's say, low range uh, hardware. Uh, so actually, if you have a look at the shell script, well, it's, uh, that's something that you can put uh, or implement even on, on very low uh, range, uh, low memory and so on hardware. Okay, uh, uh, I hope that uh, at least uh, that many of in the audience uh, could follow uh, this, uh, what was happening on the Linux system. So this was the reference implementation part. Uh, now uh, then uh, I'll quickly show some, uh, some uh, example applications. Uh, as you probably can imagine, uh, over the years since uh, 2001, uh, we have uh, made loads of different uh, implementations, uh, real business applications, and, and so on. Also, uh, but uh, today I'll just show uh, some uh, some work that we have ongoing. Uh, so, as uh, as uh, Chris Harding said a moment ago, I'm I'm also professor or official professor in in building information modeling. So this will be very building focused. Now, uh, buildings are a typical um, target for, for the Internet of Things, uh, smart products and so on. Uh, and that's because, uh, well, there are many different challenges. They have long life cycles. Uh, uh, you have information coming from CAD systems. Uh, from uh, You have different uh, machines installed uh, coming from different manufacturers. When you want to optimize your energy, energy consumption and so on, you need uh, information from uh, well about uh, energy prices, weather forecasts, uh, weather conditions. Uh, you need to be able to control different systems ins inside your, your house and, and so on and so on. So uh, <clears throat> the first uh, thing or system that I'll show uh, rapidly is uh, something that uh, or it's a system that we have implemented for one of the university buildings uh, of the Aalto University in, in Helsinki. Uh, so um, 
what you can do with the, this system is that uh, uh, we have uh, taken the, the CAD models uh, of the building and uh, try to use them for well, first uh, visualizing the whole uh, the whole building and allowing you to uh, to get access to different uh, things there. But the interesting thing here is that uh, well, for the moment you can get access to uh, to the installed sensors uh, and get the the readings uh, of them in this way. Okay, so this is sort of a well 3D visualization that's made mainly because it's uh, it looks good and and so on. But uh, what is more uh, useful is uh, actually this kind of a 2D view where we can visualize uh, a heat map in this case of the different uh, different rooms uh, on one floor. Uh, we can also change it into humidity and uh, or any other values. And uh, uh, we have the possibility to actually go and have a panoramic view of uh, the different some of the rooms, uh, so here in this case, I'm in the corridor and apparently it tends to flicker a little bit when I move around. So I will stop here. And uh, here I can also see one of the sensors uh, where it is actually installed as well as the, as the current, uh, current readings uh, from it. Uh, now uh, the purpose here, it's uh, not just uh, to uh, sort of uh, install sensors and get values from them. It's really about that when we install these sensors, they publish uh, immediately that uh, now I am here in this place and I can provide you with this information. So temperature, light, CO2, humidity, and uh, occupancy information. And uh, uh, then the building and the uh, building itself, as well as uh, this whole uh, visualization tool, can know that, uh, okay, now I have a new information system. It happens to be a sensor that provides me with this, uh, this uh, different uh, information. So uh, then once I have all these uh, different information sources, publishing information using OMI and ODF, I can uh, combine them and, uh, and build uh, new services for energy efficiency or, or combine information from access control systems, uh, from heating systems, and and so on and so on. Now, uh, <clears throat> I was say, speaking about this bi-directional controller quite a bit uh, in the beginning of, uh, of my presentation, and uh, I really think uh, the Internet of Things and uh, what we are doing should, uh, should make it possible to control uh, or improve uh, the way in which uh, buildings and all other systems are, are controlled. Uh, so what I will be showing next, uh, it is, uh, I'll quickly jump back to this slide. Uh, it is a system that uh, is installed in our house. In fact, it's a ventilation machine that looks like this with heat recovery and so on. Uh, in modern buildings, uh, this is sort of the cornerstone uh, piece of equipment for for making uh, things uh, for, or for making buildings energy efficient. Now, what makes this machine interesting is that uh, immediately when you have installed it in your house. Uh, and if it's connected to the internet, uh, then it will immediately give you access uh, to this uh, kind, to this user interface. Uh, so from a smartphone or any kind of browser or whatever, and it, it will tell you its phone serial number, as you can see here, as well as a pin code, uh, so that you can establish uh, an SSL secured connection all the way from. Uh, from my browser to uh, to the actual machine. Now this is uh, quite important uh, that uh, you do have a complete security, as you will see in a moment. So uh, what uh, I can see in this uh, window now, it's the current status of uh, of the machine. So uh, HRC, that's uh, I don't remember what that is uh, to be honest, uh, but uh, you can get access to different kinds of set points. Uh, but uh, to get the connection with OMI and ODF, I will jump uh, to this uh, measurements uh, window here, where you can see uh, uh, all kinds of uh, sensor information which have been collected here in southern Finland uh, in the last uh, week. So these are real data, as you can see by the curve. You can also see that there was a real uh, network out outage here. And uh, 
in this case, uh, for these uh, sensor values, uh, they are collected and stored uh, with a 10 minutes uh, time interval. So that's uh, showing this interval-based uh, subscription that uh, for this kind of information, it's enough to get it every 10 minutes. Now, that has been selected so that uh, also the, this machine maintenance provider and manufacturer can gather relevant uh, data about these machines such as the uh, heat recovery rates on the incoming and outgoing sides of the machine. I won't go into the details about what these mean, but you can actually deduce uh, quite a lot from these values. So uh, you can deduce uh, how, uh, how well the machine is performing, but you can also see if you should change your filters uh, soon or if anyone has been changing the air flows uh, or doing something that will that might eventually make your, uh, your home uh, become uh, get moisture or, and, uh, and health problems of all kinds. Now, uh, what I usually show uh, to emphasize the importance of uh, security in, in the Internet of Things, it's uh, the CO2 sensors that we have installed in uh, two of our bedrooms. So uh, these CO2 sensors are used uh, for controlling the machine so that, uh, that the CO2 level doesn't get too high. Uh, uh, at any moment, and that's usually during the night because it's uh, in, in the bedrooms. So. And uh, well, from this kind of, of course, you can actually use uh, quite a lot of uh, very sensitive information, such as how many people have been have been sleeping, sleeping where, and, and so on. So I won't uh, stay here for longer at this page. Uh, now, <clears throat> so those uh, values were collected every 10 minutes. Uh, that's uh, uh, opposed to what you can see here, actually, this uh, value 632, that is updated on a much more, much uh, quicker interval. So, in this case, since uh, the machine and the system knows that uh, there's a browser now uh, looking at this information, then it starts updating this value with a, with a much uh, quicker, um, quicker pace. Uh, so, this is to show that. Uh, Okay, in most uh, cases, uh, you, it's enough uh, to collect information every 10 minutes, but uh, when the context changes that somebody is actually looking at this and might want to control it, then you have to uh, update information much uh, quicker. And in this case, uh, you can even control it uh, uh, online and directly in real time. So uh, now since I happen to sit actually in my home uh, presenting this, uh, I can even hear the airflow uh, increasing, but that doesn't make a difference. I could be in, in the United States or anywhere. Okay, those were the <clears throat> demonstrations uh, of some systems, uh, mainly because I like demonstrating <laughs> real systems. Uh, uh, but it was also for showing uh, or for linking to uh, to the fact that uh, or the kind of uh, real applications that OMI and ODF have been uh, have been specified for. So uh, you already saw this uh, picture in, in smaller earlier, but uh, as I said, OMI and ODF uh, are really made for ena enabling all these uh, red connections uh, that you can see here. And uh, we have actually implemented quite many of these uh, different kinds of, of services already. Uh, I think I spent more time than I expected on uh, on the earlier part of, of the presentation, so I won't won't go into the details of this slide. Now, <clears throat> uh, about other Internet of Things standards, uh, there has been uh, well, due to the increased uh, visibility of, uh, of the whole Internet of Things, uh, there has also uh, been a lot of uh, Internet of Things standardization activities uh, going on. Uh, but uh, what we can see is that most of those uh, new standards uh, are really much more or less machine-to-machine -machine standards, such as MQTT, uh, COAP, and so on, which are uh, binary standards uh, using TCP or UDP as, as their underlying protocols, which uh, gives you some challenges in going through firewalls uh, and uh, also when you, are when you have mobile devices and so on, even though uh, you can come over that using, for instance, web sockets. But the main thing is that, that uh, these protocols are not really intended nor suitable for system-to-system -system communication in the sense that uh, that I showed you earlier, meaning 
weather forecast services uh, and so on. Uh, they are really intended for being implemented on, on low range uh, cheap hardware and with, uh, with slow connections. Most of these new standards also use uh, the publish subscribe model rather than using the observer model. I won't go into the details about this, uh, this neither, but uh, that uh, using the publish subscribe model uh, usually signifies that you have to have a, a, a more powerful uh, server machine uh, that actually uh, handles uh, most of the data. With observer, it's uh, much uh, more much uh, easier uh, and intuitive, simple to do pair-to-pair -pair communication between any systems. So uh, <clears throat> then the other end of the standards uh, perspective is uh, are the REST APIs. Now there are many, many Internet of Things uh, platforms and systems and applications that provide you with REST APIs for commu communicating with them. But uh, in reality, as uh, uh, you know, well, REST is not a standard, it's just uh, an architectural model of how you should build uh, web systems. And uh, most uh, or just about all uh, Internet of Things REST APIs that I have seen so far have been proprietary. So there's really a huge, huge number of, of, of different uh, REST APIs for the Internet of Things and integrating with them and communicating with them is, uh, is not immediate uh, at all. So uh, the conclusions, uh, <clears throat> well, uh, in the best case, uh, we think that OMI and ODF uh, will do the same thing for the Internet of Things as uh, HTTP and HTML for the web, meaning uh, that they would be uh, sufficiently generic and good to be usable for anybody for publishing information, and uh, that there wouldn't be, uh, be uh, tens of different standards uh, used by different uh, different uh, organizations, servers, companies. Uh, as you saw, uh, well, OMI and ODF, uh, they enable you to create a new Internet of Things systems or systems also without programming, just in the same way uh, that you can publish information using uh, HTML and HTTP without doing any, any programming. Uh, then this uh, keep it simple, uh, well, the OMI specification is that 21 pages, ODF is 10 pages. Uh, so I think we have managed to keep it simple, but that's also because uh, they, we have been working on these specifications uh, over many years, uh, uh, gone through many real life implementations and so on. So they are pretty mature. And that's, uh, well, nobody knows uh, who actually uh, said this thing that I didn't have the time to write a short letter, so I wrote a long one instead. Uh, that's, uh, what, uh, that's something that also applies to OMI and ODF. We have been improving them uh, a lot over the time, so, uh, so now that we claim that they are generic, compact, complete, and they are also extensible for, for, for use in, in, many, in all kinds of, uh, of uh, applications, IoT applications at least. So uh, anyway, so well, we all know about uh, the challenges of interoperability, and when we start implementing or when we really want to go uh, for the Internet of Things, uh, cyber physical systems and so on, uh, it will be a nightmare if, if we don't uh, uh, come up with, uh, with some generic standards uh, such as OMI and ODF that can do the same thing for the Internet of Things as HTTP and HTML for, for the web. Well, thank you, Carrie. That was a uh, that was a, a fascinating presentation uh, for me, at least. Uh, and I see we have a uh, pretty significant number of questions. I don't know that we'll have time to get through all of them, but um, let's see if we can at least get through some of them. Um, let me start with one on a fairly basic level. Um, which is about whether we could increase efficiency, perhaps by reducing the uh, the overhead in the XML uh, envelope, and specifically, uh, why not use JSON instead of XML? Has has the project team thought about that at all? Uh, yes, we have. Uh, actually, when we started specifying uh, OMI and uh, ODF, uh, JSON was not a big thing, uh, but uh, one reason for I'll just jump 
uh, quickly here. One reason also for using XML schema is that uh, that it's a sort of more rigorous and formal tool for specifying uh, this kind of standards uh, rather than using uh, JSON uh, prototypes or, or similar. But uh, uh, as you know uh, well, uh, you can uh, translate uh, XML quite uh, more or less one to one uh, into into JSON, and we have actually done that in real implementations. Okay, so it, what you're saying basically is it it should be possible to use JSON, uh, but it's not a part of the standard at this point. Uh, but it's something that would still be considered perhaps for a future uh, future version. Yes. Okay, um, let's. Um, I've combined two questions there. I'll probably be combining two at this point. Um, oh no, let me let me do another straightforward one. Hopefully first. Is there? It's from um, Paramesh. Is there any limitation on the maximum length of the data and total count specified for info items? No, there's none. Okay. So that's uh, and can we embed a sensor ML message or something similarly complex inside an info item element? Uh, I don't remember exactly what sensor ML looks like, but uh, the answer is uh, yes. Uh, we have a uh, you we have uh, in real applications also uh, used even CSV uh, for instance uh, as uh, as info item values. Uh, because with ODF uh, you can uh, you can have uh, at least the column names as uh, metadata, for instance. Uh, so if you want to make it uh, more compact, uh, then you can do it this way. So here's another question from Schult. Um Are the companies producing the readers writers such as RFID buying in, or is this simply an academic standard? Uh, well, I don't think the RFID reader producers will be doing it because they uh, they are more focused on EPCIS, which is a global standard that uh, which even that hasn't been completely adopted. Uh, well, it's it's sort of a tricky question in the sense that it's not an academic uh, exercise uh, because uh, my company and many other companies have been implementing uh, these uh, standards uh, in, in their own systems. Uh, but it's uh, there's of course a, a huge challenge in in take up uh, of, of new standards by by companies. So that's why we are pushing these reference implementations uh, also in order to make it uh, make it easier. Okay, perhaps it might be worth saying uh, something more about the the Promise project and the uh, what led, in fact, the requirements uh, as to why the um, why the protocols were were developed and took the form that they did. Um, what what was the what was the reasoning behind, for example, uh, um, adopting the observer pattern rather than publish subscribe? Okay, but uh, the requirements, uh, so uh, I mentioned that we had uh, these uh, Caterpillar machines and uh, and, and uh, trucks and so on, uh, which already have uh, have their own embedded uh, controllers uh, on them, uh, as well as RFID tags uh, and so on. Uh, so, um, well, the, the re well, the requirements uh, sort of came from that, yeah. Industrial companies participating in that project, and I guess they uh, they had some input as to what would be useful features in the protocols. We were actually implementing this uh, with we had uh, six six different industrial imp implementations of uh, of the predecessors of uh, OMI and ODF, uh, and that uh, included SAP, for instance. Uh, it really came from real requirements of, of uh, real products, uh, real systems of, of real companies, uh, definitely. Even even the, this dialogue platform was uh, it was developed for real uh, re industrial requirements for tracking shipments uh, in multi-organizational projects uh, over the world. Uh. Okay, um, there's a question. Um, any suggestion on a point of contact to begin getting one's feet wet uh, from Mahmoud? 
Uh, well, uh, I think uh, if you're a member of the Open Group, uh, the one good uh, thing to do would be to join the Internet of Things work group or open platform work. And uh, then I also had this uh, link um, now for accessing uh, the, the software, which is uh, the one in GitHub just now. It's a temporary one. We will move this uh, somewhere else, but all that will be published uh, through the Internet of Things uh, work group. Uh, as well as uh, the, the place where you saw the reference implementation. So people could go to, to GitHub and, and get something that they could, could start start playing with? Yep, you can get that already now, in fact. Uh, but I would maybe not recommend doing it straight away. Then again, yeah, why, why not? But there might be some, some more things to clean up uh, still. Okay. Um... Um, it seems that Internet of Things, this is from Jess Binder, Internet of Things use cases are more for construction and manufacturing industries. Do you have any thoughts about other industries such as banking, finance, insurance, or other services-based ones? Uh, to be honest, uh, no. Uh, I guess there could be, but it's, uh, it, it's not something that, that I have personally been working with. Okay, I guess in principle a sensor is a sensor whether it's uh, uh, on a uh, on a digger or on a cash machine, but uh, you haven't sort of had experience in or, or done any thinking specifically in that no, but area. I, I should add something. We have uh, applied uh, OMI and ODF also to uh, design processes uh, where different designers in different uh, companies uh, can subscribe to, to changes in design documents made by, by other designers in, in other companies. Uh, so this uh, subscribing for um, subscribing to uh, any kinds of uh, events happening such as a document being updated or, or a part of a CAD model, model being updated, you, you can also uh, apply that in at least in the design uh, domain. Uh, I guess that in finance uh, you could also subscribe to, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, the price of a certain uh, stock paper uh, falling radically or uh, or subscribing to uh, to stock paper prices. Why not? Why not? Because they are in fact quite quite general standards, but of course they, as uh, as you say, they they the, the center of of of. Uh, Requirement study uh, for them has has more been in the in areas such as manufacturing. Okay, so uh, there are uh, some other questions that we haven't had time to get to, and uh, I'm sorry that we haven't been able to do that. Um, but but uh, thank you everybody for participating, uh, and thanks particularly Carrie uh, for your your presentation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody.